Hi, I'm Tony Williams, a senior fellow with the Bill of Rights Institute, and welcome to another Bill of Rights Institute primary source close read. And for this one, we are very honored to have a scholar joining us uh, to examine the document, which is going to be George Washington's diary and actions in the French and Indian War. And you can find that document along with several others at our website, BillOfRightsInstitute.org. And if you sign up for any new Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness textbook, uh, like I said, you will find this document and many others there as well. So our guest is Stephen Knott. Welcome, Steve. Good to have you. Thank you for having me, Tony. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I'm a real fan of the work of the Bill of Rights Institute. All right, thanks. And, and we've collaborated before. You've presented us some of our seminars, so we really appreciate all you do for the Institute. Well, thank you. Well, uh, I'll introduce you, Steve. Uh, Stephen F. Knott is a professor in the National Security Affairs Department at the Naval War College. He co-chaired the Presidential Oral History Program at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia which by the way has an extremely useful website on all the presidents. He has taught teachers for many years for the graduate school program at the Ashbrook Center of Ashland University. And he's written numerous excellent books, uh, including Washington and Hamilton, The Alliance That Forged America, with yours truly. We did that one together, Steve. Uh, also, the Alexander Hamilton and the Persistence of Myth, his most recent book is The Lost Soul of the American Presidency, The Decline into Demagoguery and the Prospects for Renewal. And he is currently at work on a book on the presidency of John F. Kennedy. His website is stephenfnot.com. So you'll find lots of great lectures and, and other useful resources there as well. Steve, again, welcome and thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks, Tony. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you and to talk about George Washington, who's one of my favorites. Yeah, definitely. Mine too. So uh, why don't we jump right in and in thinking about this document, maybe provide some historical context. Can you provide a little bit of general background about the struggle for empire that was going on uh, among the European powers in North America when, when this diary was written? Yeah, you had had basically a superpower confrontation, superpowers at least in terms of the 1750s and 60s between Britain and France uh, for control of North America, all of North America, Canada and current day United States, stretching all the way down into Florida. And uh, partly this was uh, a commercial or trade conflict. Uh, but partly this was, again, a, a superpower struggle between two nations that were always trying to one-up the other in terms of acquiring bases, ports, etc., both for trading purposes, but also for strategic military purposes. Uh, the French had controlled parts of Canada, obviously present-day Quebec, and then down through into the Mississippi Valley region, there were sporadic French trading posts stretching all the way down to uh, New Orleans. The British, of course, had made uh, quite a, a foothold on the east coast of the current United States. Uh, and in fact, the Brits had the edge in this conflict in that the population of the British settlers in North America far outnumbered that of the French population. So before the war even begins, I would say strategically speaking, due to the population that the Brits had, and also due to the fact that the British Navy was superior to the French Navy, uh, the Brits were going to have the upper hand in this struggle. However, that's not how, appear how it appeared initially. And of course, George Washington was at the center of, num of a number of these early setbacks uh, for the British and their American colonial collaborators. Okay, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about the background and character of, of the young George Washington who writes this journal? Yeah, well, George Washington, Tony, as you know quite well, uh, was, was an extremely ambitious young man. 
I mean, to be appointed, what, was he 21 or so when no. Lieutenant Governor Dinwiddie makes him a prominent figure in the Virginia militia? Uh, Washington, as I said, was extremely ambitious, but it was a noble kind of ambition. Uh, this was a person who could have easily uh, lived a comfortable plantation existence and yet yearned for more. And I think he yearned for a kind of uh, secular, eternal fame, if you will. Uh, and as you so brilliantly pointed out in our book on Washington and Hamilton, uh, it was this kind of fame, the kind of fame that could be earned through merit, uh, through military accomplishment, that really uh, motivated uh, young George Washington. So again, it's, it's fascinating to me that this man who could have led a comfortable existence, could have been a, a prominent member of the Virginia gentry, chose instead to live the life of a of a pioneer and a military um, uh, and a military life, both of which were very taxing. I mean, this this man had so many brushes with death, and yet that pursuit of ambition, that pursuit of this noble fame, uh, drove him to take those risks. Okay, yeah, and then speaking of risks, uh, we, we have a very dramatic source here, and and as this source notes, and we'll look at some of the relevant sections. He received the commission from the royal governor uh, of Virginia to warn off the French. They were building a, a series of forts in the Ohio Valley. Uh, and, and as you pointed out, that, that's quite an assignment for, for a young 21-year-old. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it sure is. And to have to make his way out into really the wilderness at this point um, through some hostile uh, Native American, the, the territory claimed by some hostile Native American tribes, and also, of course, the French who were lurking out in this region. Uh, just, just, just a remarkable risk, and not to mention the weather, as you see here in one of these passages. Um, just the incredible cold, uh, the snow, the lack of roads, the lack of just basic, uh, the things we take for granted in modern life. Here's this Virginia gentryman really taking in some ways the ultimate risk, the ultimate challenge. Right, uh, you can, uh, the viewers can, can see on, on this slide right here, he gets that commission, he has to get horses and, and baggage and, and gunpowder and food. Uh, he's leaving in, in late fall, right? He's leaving in yeah. uh, the end of uh, <laughs> October. And as you say, the snow is already piling up and, and I'm not sure students understand, you know, he plunged into the wilderness, was at the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, that was the, the American frontier at the time, uh, because uh, the, the American colonists were mostly on, on the East Coast. And, and he's going on this, this, this adventure, he's, he's uh, meeting up with Christopher Geist and, and some others. Uh, and he walks hundreds of miles, right? Uh, walks, rides a horse, uh, you know, paddles. Over, over hundreds of miles of frontier territory. Uh, and, and, you know, he had, he had had some experience there, right? Uh, he had been a surveyor uh, as a young man and, and as you said, wasn't afraid of a, a little adventure. And, and in the resource, we, we have a map of this, but you know, he goes all the way up to Lake Erie. I mean, he walks and rides there from Virginia. <laughs> this is quite a car ride uh, in today's yeah. world, so. Uh, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit more to that to that frontier adventure and just kind of that that, that yeah. struggle with the elements. Well, I think I think it's it's a good thing for modern Americans to to take to take note of this because I think we have this impression, uh, and I've used this term already, of Washington being a member of the Virginia gentry, which right. he was. Uh, but again, this this was an atypical member. <laughs> of the Virginia gentry. This was a man who um, loved a good challenge and loved a good adventure and risked his life uh, in so doing. And we'll get to this shortly, I'm sure, but I mean, during both the French and Indian Wars, War and the American Revolution, this man had multiple horses shot out from under him. And the fact that he managed to live a full life uh, and die at a relatively old age for this, for this era, 
um, is really remarkable. So, you know, the people who assume that George Washington was a child of privilege, which he was to some extent, they also need to factor into this equation. This was a man who took incredible risks and who was willing to uh, uh, really, in some ways, defy death on many occasions. Right, right. And so as we see here, he's, he's headed towards the forks of the Ohio, but then uh, keeps, you know, meets up with some, some Native Americans, uh, trying to gain them as allies, uh, and uh, goes up to the forks, but then has to go further and further beyond that, right? Uh, and so as, as we go through the source here, uh, he's going up through the series of, of French forts, and they keep sending him to the next fort in the chain and the next fort in, fort in the chain. Uh, and, and eventually he goes up uh, and, and meets with them. And so how does he gather intelligence about the French forts, uh, the number of troops, their, their allies, other, uh, other important military uh, matters uh, for the colonists and British? Why, why is this so important? Well, of course, he's, he, success in any military, and this is a semi-military, semi-diplomatic venture on Washington's part, Success requires uh, accurate intelligence. And uh, Washington, by the way, throughout his entire career, both in this era and when he's the commander of the Continental Army, is a great believer in the importance of intelligence uh, and will create during the Revolutionary War a very effective spy ring called the Culper Ring that helps provide a fairly accurate, fairly consistent information on the the British military headquarters in New York. But at this time, he's reliant primarily upon uh, Native American sources. You mentioned uh, Half King and other Indian leaders who um, have been dealing with the French now for decades, and their ancestors would have been dealing with them as well. So the primary sources of information he's getting is coming from Indian um, leaders, but also uh, occasionally um, traders, uh, traders with a D, who are in this area and have dealt both with the French and the British in terms of uh, uh, marketing various goods. Right, good. So, so he's ga gathering all this information uh, and and so what's the French answer? He, he travels all these hundreds of miles, uh, goes and, and speaks to them, get, hands them the, the Dinwiddie warning, uh, and see what you know. What, what's their answer, and, and what impact does this have on on larger the larger Franco-British diplomatic situation, which which is fascinating that the, this 21-year-old really has control over, you know, sort of the the diplomatic relations uh, of these two great powers. You know, uh, his mission can can determine sort of war or peace. Uh, no question his mission could determine war and peace. Again, it's truly remarkable, as we keep saying, in terms of how youthful Washington was. Uh, the French in answer, uh, at least if we are to believe George Washington, uh, is an abrupt no uh, in terms of, of uh, acquiescing to any of the British, any of Lieutenant Governor Dinwiddie's uh, demands that they acknowledge the British presence there. Um, now look, we're getting this from George Washington's perspective. One always has to be careful with looking at any dispute uh, to try to look at sources from all sides. But from the, from the American colonial perspective, as reflected here by young George Washington, it's the French who are not only saying no to any sort of diplomatic settlement, but doing so in an almost, um, well, not almost, doing so in a very abrupt and one might say rude manner. And George, not, uh, George Washington was not the kind of person that you, you dealt with in that way. Uh, Washington had a bit of a razor thin temper and if he felt his honor had been insulted, um, I think he had a tendency to, to act also abruptly in those, ans uh, in those situations. So again, the French, the French could not have been more um, abrupt and more final in the rejection of any British demands. Right, yeah, as it says here, they told me that it was their absolute design to take possession of the Ohio and by God, they would do it. Right? Yeah. So, so it seems a little arrogant, as you say, on the, on the part of the French. Yeah. And, 
and yet the British, their absolute design was was to keep possession of the of the Ohio River as well. So so these two contend, contending empires really had the same goal, as you say, to control the trade and the the military routes, uh, settlement of the area. So all very important. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, and so within several months, uh, he's going to be sent on a mission, uh, as we're looking at, to expel the French from the forks of modern-day Pittsburgh. Uh, he's accused later of assassinating a French officer in an ambush, yeah. uh, where supposedly he may or may not have fired the first shot, depending on which source, source you look at. Uh, lost a battle at Great Meadows, and then he rallies the ill-fated Braddock expedition when the, the British colonel was killed and, and those tra tra troops are routed again. And so, so Washington loses uh, several battles out in the wilderness uh, after, after this message is delivered. And yet he emerges as a hero uh, and, and a very well-known columnist, uh, even in the 1750s, 1760s. So, so my question is, you know, what lessons did he learn from these early battles in this French and Indian War? Uh, that would later influence his command in the American Revolution. How does it how does it shape him? Sure, uh, terrific question. Well, look, one of the things he learns, and I teach at a war college, and any military officer will tell you this. One of the most dangerous moments in any sort of military endeavor is if one has to retreat, uh, and to keep one's cool, to keep your your forces um, steady, and to keep them alive. And in the many instances that you just mentioned, Tony, that is precisely what this young colonel was able to do. Keep his cool, uh, execute uh, two withdrawals, particularly the second one after General Braddock is killed. Uh, that is a very, very difficult thing to do under any circumstance, but particularly in a wilderness situation where the enemy seems to be behind almost every tree that you turn around. So that's one thing he learns. And during the American Revolution, that's going to be important, an important lesson because George Washington is going to lose more battles than he wins, but he manages to keep his forces intact. And that was the key ultimately to success in the American Revolution. The other thing he learns is that um, the importance of discipline, uh, the important and the importance of logistics. One of the things that affected both Washington's early mission to Fort Necessity and then later with Braddock is uh, the difficulty of keeping that force supplied through this hostile wilderness. And of course, logistics and supplies are going to be a major issue for General Washington during the revolution as well. It's going to be a constant issue. And one arguably that was a, as great a threat to Washington's army as the British uh, were. So uh, he learns about logistics, he learns about discipline uh, in terms of keeping his force intact. He learns also, I think, a very important lesson about civil military relations uh, in terms of his dealings with Dinwiddie and other Virginia political figures. So he's balancing sort of the military with the civilian side of things. And that of course is something that he masters during the American Revolution where he strikes that perfect balance between keeping his army intact and in fighting shape while keeping his civilian political overseers satisfied at the same time. And the final thing I'll say, Tony, that I think he learns, uh, and this one is more of a sort of negative lesson in a sense, he learns that the British look down their noses at the American colonials. Sure. Um, and uh, that is going to stay with him and certainly contribute to his ultimate break with, with Great Britain. Right, right. Okay, so some, some really powerful lessons for, for later on. Excellent. And, and just a, a general uh, question uh, as we, we conclude things uh, in, in, in our discussion of this primary source, uh, how did the, the French and Indian War help lead to the American Revolution? Yeah, I think uh, most historians would conclude, and I would put myself in this camp, that the, uh, the, the French and Indian War certainly 
uh, expedited the arrival of the American Revolution. It probably would have happened at some point, but maybe not as quickly, at least in terms of the 1770s, as it did. So uh, by the British ultimately succeeding in removing the French, for the most part, from the Mississippi Valley region, uh, the Americans no longer felt in some ways that they had to rely on this great colonial power across the Atlantic to provide for, for their protection. So the defeat of the French removes this threat all, all along the American frontier. The other thing the French, uh, excuse me, the French and Indian War uh, does in terms of expediting the arrival of the American Revolution is the British government decides that they need to raise taxes uh, to help pay for the debt that they had racked up during that war. And it was a costly war for Great Britain, well, for France as well. And I actually looked up before we came online here. By, uh, 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 by the 1770s, the British had racked up, or excuse me, by the end of the war in 1764, I should say, the British had racked up 129 million pounds of debt uh, just in terms of, of financing that war. Leads to the Stamp Act, leads to other unpopular taxes that of course produce the American Revolution. Okay. And, and do you think that um, also uh, the Americans and maybe specifically George Washington learned a lesson about uh, unity um, and about you know, working together because it, it seems that during the French and Indian War there was so much disunity, there was an attempted plan, uh, Albany Plan of Union, uh, that was agreed upon, but, but none of the legislatures voted for it. They were, they were sort of very disunited and, and not much sense of, of unity or, or common good among these disparate, very different colonies. Uh, and yet later on, Washington helps to promote this sort of more continental vision of, of what America should be. Do you think there were some lessons learned during the war? Uh, no question, Tony. Uh, this is one of many important steps towards the forging of a national, of an American identity. Um, and you're right, the, the divisions that existed uh, within the colonies, which to some extent were fostered by, by the British uh, across the, the Atlantic. Um, but yeah, there is, there is slowly but surely, I think, the formation of, Amer of an American identity which you and I have argued before, was arguably one of George Washington's greatest accomplishments, both as commander of the Continental Army and as our first president. But this, this seed of an American identity is forged right here. You begin to see some cooperation. I think the Massachusetts governor, uh, was it William Shirley, I believe, um, is dealing with his Virginia counterparts. There is, there is this formation of a kind of uh, defensive alliance that's one of the first steps towards the Continental Congress. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, Steve, I want to thank you very much for joining us uh, and examining this document uh, by a, a young and, and nobly ambitious uh, George Washington uh, and examining the, the French and Indian War and its role in, in the American Revolution uh, as well as, you know, broadly in, in colonial history. So thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Tony. I enjoyed it very much. And teachers and students, you can find more documents as well as uh, many essays and other valuable resources at Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, our free online textbook, which is available at our website, BillofRightsInstitute.org. Thank you very much for joining us for this close read.